Okay, so we're finally here at the end of the Physics 1 montage, uh, montage, marathon, whatever you want to call it. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I hope this kind of made sense as we've gone along. Now, the last bit that we have to cover here is rotational motion or, or spinning motion. For example, this. So something spinning about a well-defined axis of rotation. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to just kind of go through... I don't want to call them the formulas, but again, I'm not going to so much give the derivations here, the physical mo motivations, but I, I, I do encourage you if any of this is unfamiliar. Um, I know in my case, many times I've gone through the semester, this is what I leave to the end, and sometimes I have to rush through it. So um, with that said, so let me just throw the, the basic ideas up here and um, the, the, the essential idea just kind of even before I go into the formulas is that, you know, if you think about the comparison between straight, straightforward motion, or, or at least like you know, like motion in a line where that line might be, you know, curving versus motion in a, you know, in a, a, a essentially a static axis. So in both cases, you know, if I'm standing like this, in order to get me moving, I have to do something. I, I have to apply a force. I have to impart some work. I have to essentially use energy to get me going. And that's the same as, as if I'm standing still and, you know, about to start a sprint. So, um, there's going to be a, you know, there, or there is in fact a lot of connection between everything we've already defined and everything we will very quickly here define as well. But the, essentially it comes down to the, the main premise that if you try to initiate a change, any object will resist that, that, that interaction or that kind of nudge, if you will. So in the case of, you know, Newton's second law, this is where we first saw this, that there was some innate resistance to motion, where if you apply a force, a net force, the acceleration that results is inversely related to that mass, or as he called it, the inertia. So that's exactly how we begin to analyze uh, rotational dynamics, and more specifically. So, um, by the way, this was a, um, a, a, a bowl that it's a, I don't, I don't know what you call it, uh, numerous different types of wood that that my grandfather um, put together and he turned it and then literally just as I was going to start uh, preparing these videos I've been using for markers um, it fell off the table and I have a new chunk in it anyway so sorry that's that won't be an exam uh, but as I turn this you know you can see that there very clearly is a well-defined axis of rotation here and there is mass spread out so not every single atom is moving at the same speed and that's why this inherently invokes calculus that I'm going to skip over. Except for the fact that as you begin to get something spinning like that, each individual atom has to begin moving. Every atom has to attain a greater and greater speed, if you, for example, if you, if you keep it going faster and faster, and so that energy has to come from somewhere. It comes from a force that you apply, but that force is in essentially a tangential direction. So all of that kind of goes into this idea of rotational dynamics. And the essential thing that it relates back to is the moment of inertia. And if you can't read that writing, too bad. It says moment of inertia, uh, get used to it. Um, it it's the same in a class, uh, classroom. But the way that we define the moment of inertia, which we almost exclusively refer to as I, now, I'm going to kind of draw just an example here. Uh, this is a disk of uniform thickness, and now it's going to spin about some axis here in the counterclockwise direction. That's, that's what we always refer to as the positive direction, counterclockwise. Now, the mass of this disk, it might be uniformly spread out through it, uh, it might mostly reside towards the edge. In the case of, for example, like a bicycle wheel, almost all the mass is towards the edge. Um, it might, uh, example of like a, um, a Titleist golf ball, um, most of the mass resides towards the center of it. And the distribution of the mass and the geometry of the object both go into the calculation of essentially how spread out is that mass which leads towards how much does it resist changes in spinning. So it takes exactly the same role as M in linear dynamics. I is now what we use in rotational dynamics. So I is the moment of inertia, and it's obviously related to the mass of the system. 
but the way we specifically calculate it, and, and again, I just want to emphasize the word nature of, uh, again, before I write that, it's the resistance towards changes in its angular momentum, specifically. That, that's the most direct way to say that. So, um, I, I'll, I'll think that on my head as I talk here, just to make sure that I'm 100% confident in what I said. Uh, the way we define it, though, we begin at some radius of zero at the center, at the exact spin radius, spin axis, and we simply integrate the mass element. So we divide it into tiny, tiny chunks of some amount of mass, dm. Now, typically based on your geometry, that mass dm might be a density times a volume unit or a density times a, a, a linear length unit, a density times a surface unit. Um, so anyway, it's a dm times the r squared there. And I'll just diagram that specifically here. If we have some little chunk here where this segment of the disk that I've drawn might have a mass dm. And that segment of the disk is a distance r away from that axis. And you guys have seen this from calculus. You take that amount dm, multiply by r squared, that's what you have there. So this is a fairly complicated integral. And, and I actually do encourage you, because this is going to be some good practice for what we get to later, go back through whatever uh, section, chapter your textbook was on, and there was, it's almost certain that you had a, just a big table of a bunch of different shapes, and it showed what the moment of inertia is based on the total mass m and the total radius big R of those. Go back through and like try to just for practice do those calculations to calculate how they got that like you know like one half m r squared for a disk and two fifths m r squared for a solid sphere you know just amongst others. Um, so this is the reason why I say that is that I'm not going to do examples here, but it's really good to know how to do that because those are exactly the types of integral formulas that that are being used in you know like relativity and quantum. So. Um, okay, so I spent a fair amount of time on that because it's such the central role in rotational dynamics. Now, everything else goes, it, it kind of comes from that. So again, imagine some spinning object, and I'm just going to kind of write a spinning sphere here where, you know, just imagine it's a basketball or a globe or whatever, spinning about some axis. Now, let's say the whole thing has a mass m, the whole thing has a radius r, you can calculate the moment of inertia as a function of m and r, and also as a function of the geometry, but we don't give that a variable name. So what I'm writing there is the base, it's based on those two variables, the total mass and the overall radius or the geometry. And then if that's actually now spinning at, say, an angular velocity omega, first of all, it has some uh, kinetic energy, of course. And the kinetic energy, now going from our linear friend here, one half mv squared, all we have to do is replace, uh, so this is, we'll say linear ke and rotational ke, one half is a half. Now I'll, I'll skip over a second. Um, the velocity, if you're going forwards with velocity v, that equates to angularly, or around an axis, at a rate of omega. And we simply just change m into i. So literally, it's a matter of replacing the mass with moment of inertia, or replacing linear velocity with angular velocity. So that's the kinetic energy formula, and specifically the rotational kinetic energy. So that means that if you have, for example, a bicycle wheel that's rolling along the ground, the total Ke now is the sum of, we call it the translational, I'll just call it K tr or K trans, uh, the translational Ke plus the rotational Ke. And that's because in order to stop something spinning, uh, if it's like a bicycle wheel that's moving, not only do you have to slow the spin of it, but also you have to slow the motion of the whole thing. So we have two independent terms, and this is where things become a little bit more complicated now when you have 
translating rotating objects. So let's go ahead and move on to um, some other calculations we do with this. And there's a couple other basic formulas. Um, we know that for normal translating objects, we have a momentum, which it's a vector, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna just kind of ignore that for a moment very cleverly, or very importantly, um, for a good reason. And that's related to the mass times velocity, and so pretty obviously, um, the turning this into the angular equivalent, we call the angular equivalent of mass the moment of inertia I, we call the uh, velocity version omega, and now for no reason at all, we call that big L. So we have the angular, uh, uh, well, angular momentum here, and this is another quantity that is an essential property of the universe, that angular momentum seems to be conserved. Um, I am going to add a vector here, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna wait I'm, I'm gonna add one more bonus video about what those vector symbols mean um, In short though with the right hand rule if you're spinning around in a counterclockwise fashion your angular velocity points up out of the plane the same way your thumb does and Your angular momentum therefore does as well um, I, I have some more kind of fun things to say about that which I don't want to I don't want to impose on everyone, but um, at the same time, uh, that there is a, a directionality associated with the angular momentum. And that means that um, we have, okay, so I'll skip my premise here for a moment. Um, not only do we have an angular momentum, we also have a few other terms here, and sorry, I have some notes in front of me. Um, we define the, let's see, um, if you have, and I'll go back to the disc model, uh, so think of it as like a turntable for those of you guys who have record players. Um, if there's a turntable that's like going, it's already on, it's already spinning, if you wanna stop it momentarily to like pull the record off, you, you simply just like put your hand just on the edge, you apply a little friction, and it slows down a little bit. So in the, in the case of something moving forwards, we call it a force. In the case of something spinning around, we call it a torque. And the way that we calculate the torque on an object, which is literally just the force that slows something spin, is how I say it. It's the interaction between two objects that doesn't change their motion, but it might change how they're spinning. If, if, if that, yeah. So the torque that we apply is going to be whatever the force was. So for example, it's spinning that way, we, we might have applied a force that was, and I'm kind of trying to draw this, perpendicular coming away from that edge of it. So the force we applied there was at a distance of d, and I'm going to draw that as a vector for now, from the rotational axis here. And the way we calculate the torque here is we take the force that we apply, and we, I'm going to be devious, and you guys probably know why, and I'm just going to multiply it by the distance, just the magnitudes there. Uh, so if we apply 10 newtons a distance of one meter from the axis, we have 10 newton meters of torque. And that's the appropriate units. Um, but then what we can recognize is that the force that we actually apply may not necessarily be at a right angle, as I've displayed there. So if you vary the direction of the force, so, and I'll draw like a, a top-down diagram, let's say we have a pivoting door, here's the, the door axis here, and the door swings that way, swings that way. Now, okay, so one of the computers crashed there, but let's go ahead and uh, let's reanalyze the situation I was about to draw up. And that's the case of, instead of like a spinning sphere, let's consider a rotating, let's say a door as viewed from above, or a pivoting rod, where it's allowed to like spin like that. And let's just say, instead of pulling straight down with a force of F at 90 degrees, and I'll go ahead and draw our lever arm distance again, that's our lever arm distance D, Instead, we apply a force of F at some given angle, theta, relative to that lever on there. And what we end up finding is the steeper and steeper that angle, the less and less effect that has, and turns out the proper way to write that torque in that case is not just F times D, but F times D times, and we want something that goes towards, it gets smaller and smaller as that angle goes towards zero. And in that case, the function that 
reaches a minimum when theta reaches zero is sine theta. So this is the way that you probably saw the torque defined before, that you take the force vector, the distance vector, and then modify it by the sine of the angle to account for the fact that you're not going to rotate anything spinning if you push parallel to the axis. So that's how we would typically define the torque. Now, the better way to do that, which using multivariable calculus, which you very well may have seen, which is great if you have, is in fact using what's called the cross product, where we take the, um, I'm not going to explain how to calculate this, but we take the force, cross it with the lever arm, um, and I'm sorry, and I reverse the order there, it is the lever arm crossed with the force, and that outputs our torque T, or tau. Now, it uses the right-hand rule, and just as a refresher, let's say, and I'll just draw out the situation here, let's say we have a lever arm D, and then we have a force F upwards. And right, right angles or not, it doesn't matter. So the first, the, the first vector that we have in a cross product, use your index finger. So D goes outwards. The second vector you have in the cross product, use your middle finger, and I'm not trying to flip you off or anything, but so D cross F points this way, where your thumb goes. So in this case here, the torque that would result in applying a force that way at a lever arm distance there is D cross F goes upwards. And the good, the, the good thing about that, in this case here, if we have, a, a, so this is different than the case there. So that would correspond to applying a force upwards here at, at any arbitrary angle. Now remember the, the cross product, the, 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 the magnitude of it includes that sine factor there. So that's, that's counted for when we draw it properly like that. But so if we're applying a force F right there, and if we apply a, a force F at a lever arm distance D cross F, and the cross product uh, results this way, the torque results that way, that is what we consider the right-hand coordinate system, the right-hand rule, that everything spins around and it points out in the direction of your thumb here. So we have a right-handed coordinate system here. And, and that's why I, I, in my head, reverse those because I realized that this would have been a left-hand coordinate system in that case here. But as we apply a force that way, it starts the thing spinning faster and faster in the counterclockwise direction, increasing the magnitude of, for example, its angular momentum, which is exactly the next thing that, that, I'll, that I'll draw up here. So, um, camera one. Uh, the, the torque. We now write, and I'll write it properly here again, the torque is defined as the lever arm distance crossed with the force that we're applying at that distance. And then the other thing, if we go back to normal kinematics or, or normal dynamics, if you recall, we had said, and I'll just write over here, the force was, of course, MA. How are you going to translate that into the angular version of here? Force becomes torque, so torque, same exact thing. It's just the distance, lever arm distance crossed with it. So instead of, um, so looking at here, we have the torque takes place at F. Instead of M, of course, we have I. Instead of A, we have alpha. It's a crappy alpha, but whatever. And notice the torque has a directionality now. In this case here, we said that the torque has an upwards direction. So here, turns out the direction of the torque, if you're trying to spin something faster and faster around this way, and let's say the torque is pointing out of the page towards the camera. If it's spinning from what we consider the positive direction, and you're applying the torque in that direction, it's gonna spin faster and faster. The angular acceleration is also in the counterclockwise direction. Turns out, the angular, direct, the angular acceleration, when we give it a vector, if it's accelerating in the counterclockwise direction, it comes out of the plane as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll draw this right here in a somewhat flipped uh, fashion. So if the wheel or whatever, the turntable is spinning around in the counterclockwise direction, 
we say it's a positive angular momentum. The angular momentum here points in the positive direction here. If it's a right hand spin, if it's spinning this way around like this, it points downwards in negative direction. Now, if we apply a torque, making it spin faster in that direction, the torque, we would uh, apply the D cross F points up. And that torque makes it so that the angular momentum is even greater. It spins faster. And that's our last connection here. The torque now we can define, so using, I guess I should have written that up here, that F equals MA. That's that the equivalency there. The last thing we're going to write here is recall that when we look back at Newton's uh, second law from the point of view of um, uh, momentum and impulse, we saw that the force was actually dp dt. And we're going to apply exactly the same thing here. The torque we can now write as dl dt. Again, we're just taking the lead of how we had done this previously and replacing the equivalent variables with the angular uh, rotational version of it. And by the way, I should be kind of boxing these guys here um, because these are really very important. And um, the, the way that this makes sense to me, if we're applying a torque, in other words, if we're applying a force, making it spin faster and faster in that counterclockwise direction, in that case, as we apply a, a, a torque that would be that, that, that positive, that means that the angular momentum will also change in the positive direction. An upwards torque, so in this case here, if we're, if we're forcing it to spin faster, the torque is upwards. And that means that the angular momentum over time, if it starts out like that, it will spin faster, meaning the angular momentum is higher, and it will spin even faster as, and, and the angular momentum goes up. So in other words, as we apply an upwards torque, a counterclockwise torque, we have a faster counterclockwise spin, meaning a greater upwards angular momentum. So this vector nature of this is, is, is really very interesting. Um, and it gets especially interesting when, for example, if this is a, a, um, a bike wheel, and if these are like the, you know, the handlebars that you're holding on to, it's, um, we have these demos in class. And instead, if you try to push that way, force at like a lever arm distance there to change the direction of the angular momentum. Uh, that's something that I don't really want to cover here. <laughs> um, but is there anything else I want to cover? Um, no, I don't think so. The... Um, this is the fundamental nature of spinning objects. Now, I did, I did mention there's one last thing I was going to say.